I uh, kept hoping and still keep hoping at some level that during my lifetime, we will uh, either discover biosignatures, namely signs of life on some extrasolar planets, um, or at the very least be able to place some meaningful constraints on how rare uh, yeah. life on extrasolar planets is. Mario, it's great to see you again. The last time was in 2017 on Crete at the Physics of Fine Tuning Conference. Uh, we, we'll talk about fine tuning maybe later. Uh, I should say the videos of that conference and your uh, videos and interview is available on closertotruth.com and on the Closer to Truth YouTube channel. Um, and uh, you know, since then, of course, uh, much has happened uh, in the world and, and in science. Uh, and uh, what, one, of, one of the events that has happened has been your book on Galileo. And uh, I want to talk about that, uh, Galileo and the Science Deniers, and it is uh, just out in paperback. So what I'd like to do is, is really divide our conversation into two parts, first on the book and on Galileo and science denying and everything, and then secondly on a, a host of other subjects regarding space science, uh, and future of cosmology and areas of your uh, great interest. So when, when, when you begin the book on, on Galileo and the science design, uh, deniers, you uh, relate your fascination with Galileo to your work as uh, a leading astrophysicist on the Hubble Space Telescope. You did that for, I think, 25 years from roughly 1994. 24. 24. 24. Okay. Well, I, I like to be, we'd like to be accurate on Closer to Truth. So that's a good, uh, good correction. Uh, so describe your work on, on Hubble. I, I want to set that as the basis because it, you know, it's, it, it has inspired all of us. And why is Hub, Hubble considered such a scientific icon? And you, you call it one of the most important projects in scientific history. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I worked with the Hubble Space Telescope until 2015 uh, for 24 years. Um, Hubble, uh, there are many reasons that made it into a, you know, an icon in, in terms of scientific uh, discoveries and things. And um, in no particular order, uh, first, there are the discoveries themselves, of course. Um, uh, yes, uh, some of them really quite dramatic. Uh, Hubble played a role in the discovery that our universe is uh, accelerating, for example. Uh, by the way, in almost everything that I will mention, these were not necessarily exclusive Hubble discoveries. Uh, of course, many discoveries are made by many telescopes at the same time, but Hubble contributed significantly to the discovery of uh, the acceleration of the universe. Uh, Hubble determined uh, the, you know, some aspects of the composition of atmospheres of extrasolar planets, planets revolving around other stars. Uh, so this was quite uh, amazing. Uh, Hubble showed that there are uh, uh, black holes essentially at the center of almost every galaxy uh, in the universe, supermassive black holes. So, so the number one is the discoveries. Uh, a second thing that made it into an icon is, of course, the incredible images. Uh, the images that really, uh, you know, one, one journalist once wrote that these are like the Sistine Chapel of our century. Uh, the, the images are so breathtaking, really, that, that uh, even people who were not originally that interested in the science could relate to them. They, generate, they generated an emotional response in viewers of those uh, images. Uh, a third thing is the drama that was associated with this telescope. Uh, you remember that when it was launched, uh, there was a flaw discovered in its main mirror. It was thought to be an enormous failure. And then through uh, ingenuity of scientists and engineers and bravery of astronauts, shuttle astronauts. Uh, you know, there were servicing missions in which the telescope was not only returned to its original specifications, but also upgraded uh, several times 
uh, you know, during five servicing missions. So uh, there, there was that element. And uh, finally, another important element is its longevity. Uh, Hubble was launched in 1990 and it's still operating and operating well and still producing great science. So, uh, you, you know, there is an entire generation of young people that have not even known a world without the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, so all of this put together and a few other things have certainly made it into, you know, the thing that it is. Describe one of the, of the discoveries you mentioned, the accelerating universe, which is related to dark energy. You mentioned supermassive black holes and you mentioned, you mentioned the um, atmosphere of exoplanets. Uh, describe, take one of those and maybe which, in which you participated and, and tell us what was the, the scientific technique and technology to enable those discoveries. Sure, so, uh, you know, let, let's take, for example, that uh, composition of atmospheres of, of, of planets. So th that was something that nobody, when Hubble was designed, thought that Hubble would do something like this. Mm. But, you know, of course, we started discovering all these planets revolving around other stars. And in some cases, these planets are transiting their stars, which means they are so, in such a way in our line of sight that the planet goes in front of the star. Mm -hmm. When the planet goes in front of the star, the light from the star some of the light from the star passes through the atmosphere of the planet. Mm -hmm. And then by looking at what that atmosphere absorbs from the light of the star, we can tell something about, you know, the elements that exist in the atmosphere of that planet. So this was that, uh, uh, how that, that has been used and, and is really a fantastic technique. I, I've followed it over the years, and what was amazing is the fact that we could even see an exoplanet because it's so it's so small and its light is so minor compared to the power of the, of the nearby star. That was a that was amazing at first, and now you're making it an order of magnitude more complex by looking at the at, at the atmosphere in that very small time when you, when the, the 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 planet transitions, and you can see the difference between the planet and its atmosphere. It's just really right. remarkable. Right. Okay, let's look at the other part of your, your, your title because you call it the science deniers, Galileo and the science deniers. And uh, I think I detect some contemporary political overtones in that, but I should tell you, Closer Truth does not deal with politics, but at least we have to understand the nature of the, uh, of the title. Yes, so, uh... The political overtones are not so much in what I say, <laughs> uh, what I try to uh, combat at some level is the fact that some scientific facts have been used by politicians. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, that uh, can be very um, unfortunate. Uh, let me just, you know, say the, the main point here. The main point here is the following. Uh, it is never a good idea to bet against the judgment of science. Uh, not because science is always right. Uh, scientists would be the first to admit that sometimes they are wrong. Science is always provisional. It is uh, only in the sense that uh, it is as good as the data that are available at a particular time. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that is the case. But science has this fantastic ability to correct itself. Uh, and it corrects itself sometimes on a very short time scale, sometimes on a longer time scale. But it always corrects itself. And that's why it's not a good, never a good idea to bet against the judgment of science. Now, to make so in cases when human life is at stake, as for example, in the case of a pandemic, or to make so in the case where the future of the Earth's biosphere is at stake, as for example, in the case of climate change, is absolutely unconscionable. Uh, and that is the thing that, you know, one of the lessons that I take from Galileo and trying to convey. So my statement is a lot not political. I, actually try to 
talk against the politics, uh, you know, politicizing uh, the, the science. Let's uh, look at Galileo's life as you've uh, as you've described it, uh, particularly his position in the history of science in general and astronomy, of course, in particular. Uh, from your perspective, but a lot of Galileo biographies, as you well point out, uh, and I'd like to start by by asking you to. How did your work corroborate uh, your quote of Bertrand Russell, whose assessment of Galileo was the greatest of the founders of modern science? Yes, so I, you know, I, I hesitate to, to say about anybody that he or she is the greatest of, of anything. Uh, Galileo certainly is one of the major founders of modern science. There is no question about that. And I say that because of several reasons. First of all, he uh, established this idea that the only way to find truths about nature is through very, very patient observations and experiments. Uh, and once you do that, you do the observations and experiments, only later you can start theorizing and, uh, you know, uh, finding ideas of, you know, what you think about that. So that's one thing. So in that, he is one of the founders of what we call today the scientific method. Uh, uh, you know, the scientific method is this established uh, process by which scientists supposedly work, very rarely work in their everyday work, really. But, you know, that is sort of like a general guiding line, which says, uh, you know, if you have a theory, it should agree with everything that is known at the time. And it should also make some predictions that can be tested by future experiments or of observations and, and, and do that. What are some examples of uh, Galileo's actual experiments where he began the scientific method? So, for example, he wanted to study free fall, free falling bodies. Uh, because he wanted to prove that Aristotle was wrong when he said that heavier objects fall faster than, than lighter objects. He thought that they all fall at the same rate precisely. Uh, so first of all, he did drop balls from various heights uh, to do that. Uh, he did not <laughs> drop balls from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. That's just a myth. But he did drop balls from, uh, from various heights. But then he had this really clever idea. You see, there were no good clocks at the time. There were no good time measuring devices. So the time that balls fall in free fall are very short. And when you don't have a good time measuring device, it was very difficult to find out whether really this fell before or not or after and so on. So he had this very, very clever idea of using inclined planes. And instead of dropping balls, rolling them down inclined planes. And by taking the angle of the inclined plane to be very shallow, you know, he sort of diluted gravity, if you like, and things fell much slower, which allowed him to measure the time differences better. Uh, but how would friction come in? Because there'll be more friction on an inclined plane than there is in the air. Correct. So, so you know, I mean, Nothing was perfect, but you know, he still rolled a heavier ball, a, a lighter ball, you know, things like that. And also one of the things he wanted to check is how does the distance traveled, how does that uh, relate to the time that objects are falling? And of course, if you roll it down an inclined plane or, or free fall, uh, it's uh, actually, you know, the same law applies uh, that the distance is proportional to the square of the time. Mm. What are some of Galileo's major discoveries? Uh, what are the different categories? Well, his most important discoveries and the ones that gave him his fame were mostly in, uh, in astronomy. Uh, but of course, he did discover things in mechanics. Uh, in, in astronomy, I would say, uh, well, first of all, he showed that the surface of the moon uh, is not uh, free from blemishes. It has these craters, mountains, and, and so on. Uh, say, he said it looks like the surface of the earth. Uh, he 
discovered uh, four satellites of Jupiter, uh, which was extremely important because that eliminated the objection of those who still believed in the Aristotelian model that said, well, if the earth is just another planet, how come it's the only planet that has a moon and so on and that eliminated that. He showed the phases of the planet Venus as it moves around the sun, that it has phases just like the moon, uh, which again uh, proved that Venus was actually moving around the sun. Um, he did observations. It was not the person who discovered, but he, he did important observations on sunspots. Uh, he showed that the Milky Way is composed of hundreds uh, of stars uh, of different brightnesses and things like that. Uh, so there is a whole series really. And he even saw, um, he didn't identify them as rings, but uh, he saw Saturn's rings, but they looked to him like sort of handles on the side of, of, of Saturn. And, and, and what is less known is that he even detected the planet Neptune. Uh, he didn't identify it as a planet uh, because he couldn't see it moving. Uh, but in 1612, you already saw the planet uh, Neptune, which was officially discovered only in the middle of the 19th century. Wow. Um, I love the story that you tell of how uh, he discovered uh, Jupiter's moons over a couple of week period, watching it every night. And it, it, just give a sense of, of that experience because that's, uh, that's it's such an insight into uh, uh, what we would look today is, is very primitive, but if you really think about it, it's really a milestone in the history of science. Right, so, uh, you know, he looked at Jupiter and he saw these things which he called stars at first, uh, which, uh, you know, one night he saw three on one side and uh, one on the other side. Another night he just saw two on one side and one on the other side. One side, they were one night they were all four on one side and so on. So after seeing them a few times like this, uh, it occurred to him that they must be revolving uh, around uh, Jupiter. And, and that's what he concluded. And eventually he ended up actually even measuring the periods of revolution around Jupiter, uh, which were really accurate to within a few minutes to the periods we know today. Mm. And he was able to differentiate the four by their size or by their their uh, reflection? Well, the, you know, they appeared in different places, you know, like they, they sometimes appeared all like in one row and he could, you know, see them here and there. And, uh, yeah, but, but you're right, it was, not, it was not easy because Kepler thought that he couldn't identify correctly which, which one is which. Uh, he, he really uh, was skeptical that one can measure the periods of these, mm -hmm. of these satellites. Um, you compare Galileo's with Einstein's thoughts on science and religion. This is a topic that you've, uh, you've covered yourself. So give me that sense of Galileo's. Obviously, we all know he had great difficulties with the Catholic Church at the time, very famous uh, story. Um, and, and Einstein has had his own very specific approach to science and religion, which many people may misinterpret, but um, you know, to, to give that sense of, 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 what, of both of their approaches and, and why you sought to make the comparison. Yeah, uh, especially I made the comparison because they were rather different. I mean, their, their views on, on the relation between science and religion. There is one point that I want to make very clear. Uh, very often Galileo's conflict with the Catholic Church uh, is described as if this was a conflict between science and religion. It wasn't, and Galileo never saw it as such. It was a conflict between science and literal interpretations of the biblical text, which is not the same as, as science and religion, yes? Uh, so uh, Galileo was strongly arguing that the Bible was written for our salvation and not as a science book. And he gave many reasons why that is the case. For example, he said, the planets aren't even named in the Bible, you know. And he also said that famous saying that he didn't believe that the same God who has given us our senses and intelligence and reason wanted us to abandon their use. Uh, so, you, you know, so he insisted that 
if there is, if you, if there is an apparent conflict between biblical, a, a literal interpretation of a biblical text and what science tells us, it simply means that we didn't interpret it correctly. Mm. Uh, so, but he insisted that the Bible was mostly for ethics and for our moral behavior and so on. Mm. Einstein in some sense was the opposite, namely Einstein, when asked whether he was a religious person, he answered that he is, uh, you know, he believes in the God of Spinoza, mm -hmm. uh, that basically uh, he is in awe in front of this universe with all of its symmetries and, you know, and laws and, and things like that, but that he doesn't believe in a law, in a God that interferes in the everyday life of humans. Uh, you know, and what they do in their everyday life. So in some sense, he was, he gave God not so much a role in the moral or ethical behavior of humans. Uh, he gave God more the role of a creator, if you like. Uh, while Galileo insisted that the scriptures were mostly, you know, to guide us towards salvation. Why do you call Galileo's story a vitally important message for our times? I certainly understand why it's, it's important in the history of science and it's fascinating to, uh, to, to kind of live in his shoes and go through that again. But why is it vitally important for our time? Well, mostly it, it, it is this business of uh, science denial that we still encounter today and that Galileo had to fight with. Now, the reasons for the science denial were rather different. Uh, in his case, as I said, uh, it stemmed largely from a conflict between literal interpretation of scripture and, uh, and scientific findings. Uh, this is not the main reason for science denial today. Science denial today very often uh, is on political grounds or economical grounds on people not wanting to change their way of life, uh, sometimes on wanting to be elected in an election and so on. So the reasons are different, but the result is the same, that science is being denied. And we have to learn from, you know, Galileo, that lesson which I mentioned, which is that it is never a good idea to bet against science. Uh, never was neither in Galileo's time. You know, the fact is that by today, two popes now officially declared that Galileo was right and the theologians of his time were wrong. Uh, that, that's a major breakthrough. All right, let's, uh, let's go to our second part about space science and the whole different categories that you've thought about and worked on um, through your 24 years on Hubble and, and have thought uh, about the implications of it, which we'll, we'll discuss. So I wanna begin by contrasting the work that you did and, and on others in precision cosmology, which has uh, made such magnificent advances over the last several decades, un, un, uh, unimaginable at, at, in the early 20th century. Um, and so based upon what we've achieved so far, can we forecast or speculate what we might discover in 20 years or 30 years by mid-century? Um, how can we, uh, extrapolation, it's, it's, we can always do extrapolation from the past to the future, but how can we go beyond that? And what are the kinds of discoveries that you hope or that you think could be made as we look to toward mid-century? So, uh, you know, one of them is not, I wouldn't call cosmology, uh, but that has to do with life. Uh, I uh, kept hoping and still keep hoping at some level that during my lifetime, we will uh, either discover biosignatures, namely signs of life on some extrasolar planets, um, or at the very least be able to place some meaningful constraints on how rare uh, mm. life on extrasolar planets is. Mm. What I mean by that is that uh, hopefully within 
the next couple of decades, or hopefully maybe even a little bit less, we will either find planets around other stars in, in, in the atmosphere of which we find signs that are created, have to be created by life, cannot just be created by equilibrium chemistry. Well, what's an uh, example I, of that? I've seen different uh, theories, methane or uh, different. Uh, yeah, so a, a, examples of that, for example, is uh, a, a large abundance of oxygen. Uh, oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere was mostly created by life. Now, uh, it is not that one cannot create oxygen. For example, ultraviolet radiation can dissociate water and thereby free oxygen. But if one finds an atmosphere that is really rich in oxygen, you know, let's say the 20% level, that is really hard to do with, without any life processes. Okay. Uh, also, you know, again, in itself, it, probably most people would not regard it as sufficient evidence. Uh, but in combination with a few others, like, for example, if you find an atmosphere that is also out of thermochemical equilibrium, uh, that is what life processes do for you. For example, if we find an atmosphere that has both oxygen and methane, let's say, which under normal conditions, you cannot have an equilibrium in, with, with those two things. Uh, life processes can do that. So if we find, you know, oxygen and water, and of course, all of that in, a, in an exoplanet that is at that Goldilocks region, which is neither too hot nor too cold from its parent star that it allows for liquid water on its surface and so on, that would be great. Uh, and I keep hoping that maybe that will happen during my lifetime. Uh, you, you know, there is something that is not done in astronomy, but which is closely connected, intimately connected to that, and uh, in, in which great advances are being made. And this is origin of life experiments in the lab. Mm -hmm. Experiments in which uh, scientists are trying to literally create life out of chemistry, to, to see the transition from chemistry to biology. Uh, that actually is so advanced that I think that it is likely to happen within the next five years or maybe even less. Mm. Um, so I, I think I, I, I'm familiar with some of those experiments and I, I think that they are really clo getting close. Uh, now, what other things do I hope that we will see? Well, the James Webb Space Telescope uh, is scheduled to be launched in October of this year, uh, 2021. And the James Webb Space Telescope will show us some of the very first galaxies that formed in the universe. Um, it may uh, also uh, characterize the atmospheres of some planets. So that would be very, very nice. Um, hopefully, we will find by, uh, you know, future observations of the cos cosmic microwave background, uh, maybe we'll first of all refine our determination of all the cosmological parameters, um, you know, like the rate of expansion and things like that, the ratio of uh, dark matter to baryonic matter and things of that nature. Uh, if we're really lucky, maybe we'll understand the nature of dark energy. Why is it a hope? It would seem that at least the, the feeling is that we have such precise understanding of dark energy where we can say it's the vast majority of the composition of the, of the, 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 ma the mass energy of the cosmos, uh, what is it, 75 or 80%. Uh, so if we have that understanding of precision, why is it only a hope that we can eventually uh, understand where dark energy comes from? Yeah, so dark energy, we indeed know it's it's closer to 70% actually, but yes, but 70%. So we know, yes, we know that it's about 70% of the energy budget of the universe, uh, but we have no idea actually why it has the value that it has. Uh, you know, naive uh, attempts 
to actually calculate how much dark energy there should be, give numbers that are off by many, many orders of magnitude. And we don't understand why it is actually, it, it gets to numbers that are as low as that. So, so the, that's one the worst, thing. The worst prediction in science, it's like, one with uh, some people say 50 zeros, other people 120 zeros after it. I mean, that's the difference in the problem. So, so right, the most naive is about 120 zeros. And even if you include supersymmetry and things like that, you still end up with 50, 50 zero. Yeah, so, so we don't really understand what is going on. And we don't know, we don't have good ways to calculate the energy of the vacuum, which is what we think dark energy is. And we still even are not sure whether dark energy perhaps changes with time, or is it really a constant like Einstein's cos cosmological constant uh, or, or energy of the vacuum? So when I say, I hope, uh, you know, these are difficult questions, which we may, we may not even be able to uh, fully answer uh, until we actually have a quantum theory of gravity uh, which we still don't have. Uh, so that's another thing that we hope to have one day um, is a quantum theory of gravity. We have a fantastic theory of gravity, which is Einstein's general relativity. We have a fantastic theory of the subatomic world, which is quantum mechanics, uh, but we don't have a theory that unifies those two. So that's another thing that hopefully we'll manage to do. On another front, uh, we have still not detected the particles that constitute dark matter. Yeah. Uh, and I hope that in not too long, again, perhaps we will find that. Unfortunately, dark matter has many orders of magnitude where it can hide. Uh, so I don't know, you know whether we will. Uh, and if it will turn out that it interacts only through the gravitational force, which is extremely weak, uh, then it may be quite some time before we will know the nature of those uh, particles. So, so that's another front where I hope that, uh, you know, some advances will be made. You uh, began by talking about astrobiology and all the implications of it as, as your most exciting area. And so that naturally leads to um, your approach to what is called the Fermi paradox with what two trillion galaxies, that number keeps has gone up over my lifetime in terms of the numbers of, of galaxies in the observable universe, um, each with what, 100 million stars. And as we now know, the there are very large, the exoplanets are not unusual that many stars have, and some people estimate the number of exoplanets or at least the, no, the number of stars. So you multiply all that together um, and the Fermi paradox gets more paradoxical as the numbers of galaxies and exoplanets increase. Uh, many responses to the Fermi paradox, uh, 50 or more. Um, how do you approach it? So, yes, uh, you know, I'm aware of at least 75 explanations for the Fermi paradox. Right. And uh, when you have 75 explanations to something, it means that you don't have an explanation at all in some sense, right? Because you don't know which one is right, if any of those. Um, so, so, so here is the, the, the situation here. Uh, the problem is the following. It is true that, uh, let's say in our own Milky Way galaxy, uh, there are you know, many billions, almost one in four stars, you know, in the Milky Way has a planet that in <laughs> principle could, could support life in principle. So that gives, you know, makes billions of, of such planets. But the problem is that without an understanding of what it takes for the origin of life to occur, we don't actually know really uh, whether or not this is surprising or not. Because if, for example, the conditions that are precisely needed to have chemistry turn into biology are such that the chances for that are less than one in some billions, 
then even though you have some billions of planets, you know, you, you still don't have any, or we have very, very few. So for as long as we don't understand at the same time the origin of life, when, or even how life exactly started on Earth and, and, and what it took, uh, it is very hard to put numbers of that. That's one part of the problem. Another part of the problem, which um, I see, is that we don't know whether biological life as we know it is not a rather short-lived phase in the evolution of life. Uh, you know, people like Ray Kurzweil, uh, you know, like to say that within a few tens of years, uh, artificial intelligence will take over and will be the dominant type of life form. Now, you know, even if you are more skeptical and you don't think that it will happen within tens of years, it certainly may happen within a few hundred years or a few thousand years. Why, would that, very, solve, why would that solve the frame paradox? Because then we, we might see structures that are artificially in, intelligent, uh, so-called von Neumann probes, where they self-replicate and fill the galaxy. Yes, but but please note that uh, those uh, once they turn into an artificial intelligence type life, then then they are no longer limited by the types of things that we are limited by, and then they really may be more advanced than us by billions of years. Uh, and if they are more advanced from us by billions of years, then if they don't want to, we will never find them. Uh, they may know that we, these worms, exist here, but uh, for us, you know, they may not be even attached to the surface of a planet, uh, which is where we normally look for such things. Um, but, but, but that argument, along with all the other 74, 75 arguments, assumes that that explanation applies to everything, that all uh, evolved artificial intelligence on all of these uh, potential planets have the same way of thinking. And if anything, evolution and development tells us the opposite, that there should be a great profundity of differences. Because Correct. There's no, there's no overarching trophism that demands everything in one direction. So if that were the case, then any explanation has to, you have to assume it applies ubiquitously all over. Because if there's one exception, that one exception can, can then propagate exponentially to where something is, uh, is detectable, and yet it's not. Correct. I mean, if, 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 if there are lots of them, then that it becomes correct, that there must be some that behave differently than others and so on and this. But if it is still rare, then, you know, you don't know whether the rare ones, what they do. Okay. Uh, so, so, so rareness is, is an interesting so, point. So, so, the, so there is the possibility that there is a combination of factors, okay. that uh, life is rare, or at least complex life is rare, yes? And they are non-biological. And that makes, starts to make it really hard to, to understand their motivations, how they're gonna behave, what they want and what they want to do and so on. Can, can we use the Fermi paradox in a sense to put constraints on the, um, on the probability of life forming? Is, is that a, 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 a fair scientific uh, way of thinking? That is w definitely one of the uh, solutions that has been suggested. I mean, you know, it's this, this rare air earth type uh, argument, which says that life requires such precise conditions and so on, uh, that in fact, it has emerged only in very, very few places that it is extremely rare. Uh, and you may, you may be familiar with a famous argument made by cosmologist Brendan Carter, yes. uh, who uh, actually suggested on, on the basis of something very unexpected. It, it's a very clever argument, which I don't think, think we should take too seriously, but you know, we should definitely think about this. 
he just made an argument based on the near equality of the time that intelligent life emerged on our planet and the lifetime of our sun to argue that intelligent life is extremely rare. And perhaps we are, you know, even alone in the Milky Way galaxy. Mm -hmm. um, what's your personal opinion? I mean, if you had to pick your... My, my, my personal opinion, but it, it is not, you know, at this point, it's, I would say it's not a scientific opinion. Oh, it is, I, I, it is, it is really more, uh, I'm a great believer in Copernican humility, mm -hmm. uh, namely, which says that we cannot be that special. I mean, we are special in many ways, but we cannot be that unique. So my feeling is that uh, simple life, you, you know, like microbial life or things and so on, uh, should occur in other parts on the, in the Milky Way. Now, I, I, I keep men, uh, mentioning the Milky Way because in other galaxies, you know, even if life exists, it's very hard for us to find it and so on. So we should concentrate on the Milky Way galaxy, on, on our galaxy. We have, we, have enough, think, we have enough stars and planets here to keep us. Going. Right, right. So, so I, I must say, I would be surprised if uh, even simple life doesn't exist elsewhere in the Milky Way. I, 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 that would, I, I would find that surprising, uh, even though, like I say, I cannot prove that that's the case. So, so my it, hope is, so uh, like I said, my hope is that we will be able to either find biosignatures or be able to put numbers on how rare it is, you know, to say like among all Earth-like planets in the habitable zone of a sun-like star and so on, less than one in a thousand, you know, life started on them. Yeah, but one in a thousand times. Uh, I'm just, I'm just, I, you I just. Know, that if, you have, if you have one in a thousand, times, I'll pick a number, 100 billion uh, 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 exoplanets, I think that gives you 100 million uh, in, which, in which to choose and which you, which you have life. That, that, that is correct. But you know, initially, the telescopes that we have or are currently being planned will only be able to characterize the atmospheres of, you know, maybe at most a few tens of planets. So, uh, you know, so it will not still give us anything better perhaps than a limit. So if we were sitting here a million years from today and we've had all the technology uh, grow, and still uh, we were talking about the Fermi paradox because there was no evidence a million years from today, uh, what, how would we characterize that? A million years from today, I think, um, you know, at that point we would have to start concluding that um, complex life is rare <laughs> in the Milky Way, yes. Okay. Let's segue from that to uh, the topic I mentioned at the beginning on, on fine tuning, because uh, fine tuning is, a, um, is a, a way of thinking that has come out of, uh, of, of physics, particle physics has kind of exploded in terms of its, um, its uh, impact in the, in the scientific consciousness. Uh, it has been used, of course, to justify other kinds of things like a multiverse, although multiverse it's not the it's not, it, multiverse comes about because it's the product of, of physical uh, other other aspects of physics like like inflation theory. But nonetheless, it has been used to to uh, corroborate it. It's also been used, of course, uh, in religious circles to justify some supernatural or, or, or a creator, or a, a, a god. Um, uh, and yet, and some physicists would even say that there is no real fine tuning because the the bound the the the, the era of, of, of bounds of uh, of the of the constants are, are are bigger than we thought, especially when you move constants in um, in some sort of a multiple way, as opposed to looking at one individually. So you know, with all of this background, how how do you look at fine tuning? Uh, I think that, you know, uh, there are some parts of fine tuning which uh, people have argued for, 
uh, where the fine tuning is not as impressive, perhaps, mm-hmm. as has been claimed. Namely, that uh, there still could be changes uh, which are non negligible uh, in values of some constants, and we could still have life emerging, for example, and things of that nature. So, so in some of the cases where fine tuning has been claimed, uh, I did not find that the uh, necessary tuning was, was that uh, incredible. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is that in the context of the multiverse, if one accepts that, uh, then fine tuning some, somewhat loses its meaning. Uh, because if you have a huge ensemble of universes where you have uh, almost all possibilities, let's say, of values of constants and so on, uh, then of course we will find ourselves in one of in 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 one of that subgroup, which where the constants were such that they allowed for us to uh, emerge, uh, and so. Uh, the whole concept of fine tuning, uh, if you want, uh, maybe pushes you towards the idea of a multiverse, but then I wouldn't call it fine tuning so much anymore because it's not that in our universe, you know, things were so fine tuned. It's just, yes, in our universe, the values are that because otherwise we wouldn't be here to wonder about this. Right. It's just like the the, the question of, we don't need to wonder why we're not living in the sun. That, that's not a question that we ask each other because if we, we did, we wouldn't be able to ask right. that question. So it's, that's the, the reverse, the obverse of, of, what, of what you said. So, that may, uh, so, so is, that, is that your, your view? Uh, yeah, I, I personally see uh, absolutely no reason why we shouldn't consider the possibility of a multiverse. Uh, I, uh, you know, I would be very happy if we managed to find things where uh, the idea of a multiverse uh, makes uh, some predictions within our own universe, which can be tested. Uh, I, I hope that we will reach a point like that. Yeah, that's, con- uh, that's controversial now because uh, more recently, some uh, physicists, astrophysicists have come out on the other side of that and basically claiming that that, that can happen. And, and if that can't happen, if you cannot have experimental observational um, uh, science uh, to see the, uh, a multiverse within what we can see, then a multiverse is outside of the concept of science. This is a very yes, this, uh, issue. This has been the claim, but 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 look, uh, we have never seen free quarks, and and still, uh, I, I don't know of any physicist who doesn't believe in quarks, uh, and, and the reason is that the existence of quarks makes predictions in things that we can see. Mm-hmm. Uh, and enough of those predictions, which makes us believe in things that uh, you know we cannot see. Similarly, you no, know, because our universe is accelerating, uh, there will be th- parts of our universe which you know will never enter our our even our, our horizon anymore, our cosmological horizon. And uh, we still believe that, that that it's out there, even though we, we will never see it. So. Uh, I think that the way that science works is that if you can have enough predictions here, uh, which you can test, then you are forced at some point to believe in things that also that you cannot see. And, and th- the point is very simple. You see, uh, we once thought that we are at the center of the universe and blah, 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 and we turned out not to be. And we now know uh, that not only there, uh, you know, we live in a galaxy, but there are maybe two trillion galaxies, you know, on our and uh, there are planets like the Earth or similar to the Earth, you know, in the billions in the Milky Way, and, and so so everything turned out to be not un- non-unique. Mm-hmm. Uh, so why should our universe be 
uh, unique, you know. Uh, as long as you have some models, like, you know, like the inflationary model or turn on inflation, uh, that at some level predict the possibility of a multiverse forming, um, I don't see a priori at least a reason why not to believe that that is possible. The Copernican theory uh, on steroids. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and that leads to kind of the broad speculation. I know you, you, you've looked at it, uh, not, not just, you know, a million years uh, uh, into the future, but, but really time spans that we can see in the physics, uh, physics of black holes, for example, uh, the far, far future. Um, what do you see for the far, far future? It's all speculation, but I, I love doing that, uh, based on real science. Uh, for life and for sentience, however we define that in the future. Uh, in the future, I mean, if we talk about uh, tens or, or hundreds of billions of years, even trillions of years in the future, um, how can wh wh what are your thoughts when you when you're asked that question? Um, well, I don't know that I can talk about such long times. Uh, uh, you know, of course. There are things we know about the universe which we know they will happen. For example, uh, you know, if the cosmological constant is really a constant, as in Einstein's theory, then we know that our universe will go on accelerating. And in that case, uh, we know that, uh, I don't know, some two trillion years from now or something, uh, uh, if somebody is still in the Milky Way, they will not see any other galaxy. Uh, you know, they will be the only galaxy that they see in the universe. They will literally not see anything else. Uh, we also know that if the cosmological constant is not constant, then even more dramatic things can happen. We can reach something like a big rip or we can even recollapse, uh, depending on, you know, what, what sign it has and so on. Uh, but but even if it is really a cosmological constant, we do know that, you know, we, some years from now, and I mean lots of years from now, we will not see anything outside the Milky Way. And we also know uh, that, uh, you know, things will run out of gas. So it will, you know, new stars will not be born and things like that and so on. And if we believe some of the predictions of particle physics, then eventually everything will decay and, uh, you know, even protons and so on will decay. And so the universe will reach a very, very cold death uh, under such conditions. So that, that's on a very, very long time scale. Uh, you asked more on an intermediate type, type of time scale. And there, um, I, I, I belong to those group of people that do believe that uh, AI, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, will take over. I, I, I believe that, uh, I, I don't see a reason why if nature could form such complex things in which um, consciousness emerged, um, I think it is possible, of, although I don't know that it is uh, necessary, or you know, it, it absolutely will is, is that it is possible that consciousness is an emergent property, uh, which all very complex systems uh, develop, and and that would mean that uh, you know, in the it's at some point in the future, uh, that type of intelligence will take over uh, biological. Uh, intelligence, the, the type of wet brains that we are used to. So I think that is definitely possible in the, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of, or millions of year time scale uh, that we will see that. Would it, um, people talk about the difference between explorations and potential colonizations of the solar system of it or the Milky Way beyond it in the time scales we're talking about um, with uh, humans or however we, we are constituted uh, versus AI, pure AI. Uh, what, what it, is there any deep meaning to whether 
we colonize or whether we explore space be, with, with some semblance of our biological uh, legacy or just pure AI, they would be the same thing. And the a fundamental question is in that um, comparison, is the question of whether super AI would be conscious, would have internal experience, internal awareness, is, would that be an important consideration? I think it would be an important consideration. If I think if, if this super AI uh, will have consciousness, then I think you know, we should definitely see uh, them doing the exploration the way they want uh, as something that is not only inevitable, but uh, probably even desirable. Uh, if on the other hand, uh, these things uh, remain as zombies uh, without consciousness, uh, then I, I think, you know, the experience is rather different. And I think that uh, even though these machines uh, can do the, will certainly be able to do the exploration itself, uh, far better than our bio biological selves will be able ever to do. Um, we will want to have that uh, consciousness component that comes from humans uh, being involved uh, in, in what's happening. Even if humans are not, uh, you know, the ones who travel to these places uh, themselves, because it's difficult to try. I mean, yeah, we can travel to Mars, perhaps, but, you know, to the moon, to Mars, perhaps, uh, maybe even to Europa. Uh, but by the time you start traveling to even the nearest star, you, you are starting to talk, you know, talk very long time scales. So uh, it makes much more sense to send machines there. Uh, but if the machines are conscious, then, yeah, they can go on and do whatever they want. Uh, if the machines are not conscious, then uh, somebody here, it would be good to, to have that, uh, uh, you know, that input uh, that comes from actual consciousness into this thing. And those machines would be just the collectors of data. Uh, so, yeah, so I do see a difference between whether the machines are conscious or not. Mario, this has been uh, terrific. I, I, I actually, that was pretty much what I wanted to cover. But when I began thinking about the work that you've done over the years, I realized that I made a really bad mistake because when we met in, and had our interview in Crete, um, I forgot to ask you a, an important question that's really a theme of a, of a book that you wrote. The book was, Is God a Mathematician? And the closer to truth theme that we ask is, is mathematics discovered or invented? And there's a nice articulation between the two. So give, give me a sense of, uh, of is mathematics discovered or invented? And is God a mathematician? So my, my personal feeling is that that questions, question is not being posed correctly. Because when, when one asks, is mathematics invented or discovered, it leaves you with the impression that it has to be one or the other and there is no other possibility. And in fact, my personal feeling is that mathematics is an intricate combination of inventions and discoveries. Broadly speaking, we invent the concepts and then we discover the relations among those concepts, the things we call theorems, we discover. So I'll, I'll give you an example, yes, for example. Uh, there are no square root of minus one. So to, in, to do the number i, yes, which is uh, the square root of minus one, I regard that as an invention. I agree. We invent that concept. But once we invent that concept of complex numbers, we discover a whole treasure of theorems about complex numbers and all kinds of things that complex numbers do. And those are discoveries because they are imposed on us. Once we invented the concept, all the rest is being imposed on us. And 
There is a related question to this, which I also discussed in that book, which is, you know, we tend to think that, for example, the natural numbers, that anybody who ever deals with mathematics will have to deal with natural numbers, you know, one, two, three, four, five, etc. Uh, but the question that I actually borrowed that from the late uh, fantastic mathematician, Sir Michael Atia, uh, you know, said, let's suppose that the intelligence resided in a single jellyfish that resided at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. All that that jellyfish would be able to uh, feel would be the motion of the water, the temperature of the water, uh, the pressure of the water. Would that intelligent jellyfish have invented the natural numbers? I'm not so sure because there is nothing to count there. Uh, more likely, it would have invented something that has to do with more continuous things, you know, like temperature, like pressure, and so on. So the reason that we humans well, in the form of the ancient Babylonians and, and Egyptians, came up with geometry, Euclidean geometry at the beginning, and theory of numbers, number theory, has to do with our perception system. We are extremely good at seeing, you know, that this object ends here and then there is background, and this computer ends here and then there is background, and so on. So this led to this idea of numbers that you can, you know, differentiate the objects. We're also extremely good at seeing that, you know, this is a straight line and it's, it's not a crooked line. Our, our eyes are good for that. We, we can distinguish between a circle and an ellipse, even small deviations, you know, we can distinguish. I, I believe that that led to the, you know, the fact that geometry was one of the first, uh, branches of mathematics to emerge. Had our perception system be, been completely different, you know, like we saw in the very far infrared so that everything would be blurred for us, we might have not come out with, uh, you know, with this specific geometry and, and, and number theory, but some other type of mathematics, you know, like, I don't know, cellular automata or, you know, some, some other forms of mathematics. So these are related questions. Now, mind you, I don't claim that my opinion prevails. I mean, <laughs> if you ask any mathematician this question, many of them think that mathematics is discovery and, 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 and <laughs> no invention. Uh, there are some mathematicians and some non-mathematicians that think that it is all inventions. Uh, I, I think it's this combination of inventions and discoveries. Yeah, but once you say that, though, this, the, the discovery part is, 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 is to me quite um, a, a binary, that if there's anything to discover, that means it pre-existed and, and has a, an independent, necessary, potentially existence, independent of us. So it's just a question of the scope of, of the discovery. But once you say that it that there's something to discover, then it is discovery, even though we can impose on it all sorts of structure. Well, but you see, the thing is that for us to be able to make those discoveries, we needed to invent something. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the thing. So it's, it's not really in some universe, I don't know. It, we invent something, and then in that universe that we invented, it is that we make those discoveries. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the way we'd have to. Okay, so you, you have to answer the question of the title of your book: Is God a mathematician? So, so you, you, well, you know that question. Was, that question was not meant to uh, to say, you know, what is God's profession. <laughs> it, it, the question uh, addressed the question of how come mathematics has the powers that it has right. that we can explain the universe with it, right. and. You know, I, I will admit that I don't know the full answer to that. What I do know is that mathematics is indeed extremely powerful, for example, in describing the basic laws of nature. Uh, 
uh, but mathematics is less powerful when it comes to describing very, very complex systems. You know, like in biology, for example, mathematics, yes, there are some uses for mathematics, but uh, we don't do biology by, by doing mathematics. Right. So, so mathematics is powerful for things that we have a feeling that it will be powerful for. Mm. Mario, let's, uh, let's keep in touch because as new discoveries uh, come about, hopefully in the, in the next years, hopefully, as you said, in, in our mutual lifetimes, which is about the same, I would, I would guess. Um, and as they occur, we want to come back and, and, and talk to you more and get your, get your take. It's been great and uh, keep well, and uh, we'll both keep watching. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me and I'll be happy to come back. I hope you enjoyed watching. To see more conversations, subscribe to Closer to Truth's YouTube channel.